You're listening to The Power Project. I'm your host, Brandy Voth. I also like to think that I'm your guide along this journey of purpose, which is where you will hopefully end up at the end of this podcast. I'm a mom, a wife, a daughter, a friend, an entrepreneur, an advocate in the fight against human trafficking. I wear a lot of hats, y'all, but don't we all? And most importantly, I am passionate about inspiring women to go out and lead purpose-filled lives while owning your God-given power. I have this crazy belief that we are all better when we lift each other up, which is exactly why I created this platform to spotlight other women that are leading in ministry, business, and nonprofits in the hopes that you at home will be inspired by their stories to get up and take action in order to walk in purpose and own your God-given power. Without further ado, let's jump right in. Hey guys, welcome back to The Power Project. I am honored to have my guest on today. You guys may have seen um, an article popping around Facebook that went absolutely viral. I'm a Bark US, uh, I guess, affiliate. I love this app. It's it's an app uh, for keeping your kids safe online. So I had the first email that came through sharing this story about this undercover operation where where uh, a woman had posed and they had busted a lot of, of child predators and it was a very in-depth article. And then immediately it just went crazy on social media. I started seeing it everywhere. I'm like, guys, this is the app I keep telling you about that I personally use to monitor my kids' online usage. So... I had moms start asking questions and sending me text messages and emails and, hey, what, are, what is this you've been talking about? I really would like to become more aware of what my kids are doing online and who they're talking to. And so I did what I do best, which is I go find the founder of Bark and say, hey, girl, let's have a chat and you can talk to my audience uh, because there's a lot to shove in. So I have Titania Jordan on today. She is the chief parenting officer of Bart.us. And I am so honored because I know that your schedule is absolutely insane at this point in business. So thanks for being on and how are you? Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am okay. You know, I'm not going to be like, oh, everything's great because, you know, I'm a mom and life is hard and life is crazy, but like, I'm also healthy and I'm alive <laughs> and I'm here today to talk with you. So like overall, I'm great. Yeah. Well, you know, it is, it's, it's one of those, like my husband has been out of town and you, and I haven't realized like how much he really does that I actually don't acknowledge. And so I've been doing the single mom thing and the business thing. And then I'm like, wait, I have podcast interviews and events and, oh, I have children to keep alive also. So it's a lot. It's a lot. Like you said, you know, and it's not always just rainbows and butterflies, but every single day that we're given is a gift. And yes, I believe that every time I get to connect with someone like you and share your message and your mission with the world is the gift at that moment for me. And I love being able to share that with others. So before we dive into all of the uh, all of the questions and the education that I know that you have to offer my audience, can you tell us a little bit about who you are as a, a mom, a wife, a friend, a daughter? What are all the roles you play? And sure, yeah, um, feel free to interrupt at any time in case I get long winded. Um, so yeah, I'm I am a 39 year old mom of one human baby and one fur baby. I know. I've been looking. I'm like, look at that little baby. Oh no, this is Chloe, my chihuahua. She's my baby girl. Um, but my, my son is 11 years old and, um, yeah, I, I wanted to have more kids, but after, uh, his birth, there were some complications where, um, I was told that it was too risky for me to have any more children biologically at least. Um, and so at the time I was wondering, you know, why God, like I'm, I love kids I, and there's so many kids that need homes and I want to be a mom. And, but you know, my career has also been, I feel like one of my children. And so maybe that's why we'll, you know, we'll find out, uh, I guess at the end of my life, but, um, yeah. So on that note of career, um, I am currently the chief parenting officer of a company called bark that keeps children safer online and in real life. 
Before that, um, I had been a part of three other startups that served at the intersection of parenting and tech. Um, and then before that, I had a social media marketing agency that I started um, when my son was born so that I could work from home. Um, before that, I started um, my career just in corporate America post-college at a radio station. It was the top 40 station in town. I live in Atlanta. Um, and so it was so cool right out of college to see Usher and Jennifer Lopez just walking by my desk. You know, I'm just the intern and I'm like, yeah, this is cool. I can get on board with this. <laughs> I get nervous every time I talk to anyone like on the podcast that has a radio background. Cause I'm like, listen, girl, my <laughs> audience, my audience appreciates content and the quality is not incredibly amazing. So yeah, that always, I'm always like, oh, oh, she's been on the radio. <laughs> no, it's, you know, in the age of uh, everybody it can be a content curator. Um, the content speaks for itself uh, outside of the, you know, the audio quality or the video quality. There's just right. no way, no way right. it can always be perfect. Yeah. Well, thank God, because we are not perfect here. <laughs> <laughs> Preach. We, yeah. We are highly accomplished, but we are not perfect. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And on that note, you know, um, because this, you know, serves people in the faith based vertical, you know, I don't always get a chance to talk about that side of my life, but I'm, I'm just thankful that I, I can hear. And so for anybody listening, I, I am a Christian. Um, I love Jesus, love God. Um, I also am not, uh, super judgy. Like I live, I live in Atlanta. So was raised Southern Baptist and there are certain things that come, uh, with that, um, stereotype. And I probably don't fall into that stereotype. I'm very, um, just very open and very non-judgmental. And, uh, anyway, I think sometimes Christians get a bad rap just by having that word associated with their name. I think we're sometimes labeled as closed minded and non-accepting and really backwards. And, um, hopefully through my work and opportunities like this, I, I have an opportunity to give Christianity um, a good name, a good reputation and, and spreading the word that um, we can love Jesus and we can love each other and we can also not be perfect. And there's a lot of grace there and that's okay. I'm so glad that you, that you went there with that because I, I love, you know, I love Jesus. I also cuss a little. I also, you know, <laughs> or a lot. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. And so I, I think that when we literally just say like, yes, I love God, but that doesn't make me different than you, better than you, more perfect than you. Yes, I go to church on Sunday, but I have church right here on a computer where I may have yoga pants on the bottom and my hair hasn't been washed in a few days, right? Like, you know, it's just, it's the whole, um, like you said, breaking that stigma down and then also being willing to say that we, the church, have an obligation to talk about the subjects that are difficult yeah. and, nitty and gritty and say, Hey, I'm a Christian mom. Hey, my kid accidentally found some porn on a phone or Hey, mm -hmm. my kid purposely found some mm -hmm. porn on a phone. Right. Like, yeah. yeah. And, and, and just pretending that this doesn't happen to us and it doesn't exist in our house is exact. It's perpetuating the problem. Yeah. And, and the one thing that I struggled with uh, early on in my, I think my mid twenties was, I thought I could just pray my anxiety away. I thought I could just pray my depression away. Um, and I went to see a counselor at my church and he was like, look, I take medicine for my blood pressure. Like for whatever reason, uh, that is what I have. And so what makes your depression or anxiety any different than my blood pressure or somebody's diabetes or whatever? Like there's an, a, a stigma associated with mental health specifically um, that I also like to work to reduce the stigma around because um, you can be a Christian and have depression. You can be a Christian and have anxiety and um, it's okay to, to take medicine if you need it for that sort of thing. Amen. And amen. And it's okay to talk about it and say, Hey, yeah. guess what? I'm not okay. Like, yes, <laughs> I am forgiven. I am saved by grace. I am covered in the blood, but I'm not okay. It's right. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of things I kind of want to unpack mm -hmm. on this. So 
in the and because I've heard this in a lot of different realms from other women in the IT space and and I've heard so many women say like I'm a woman of faith in the IT space and that's mm-hmm. a really tricky balance. Yeah. Doing what you do and we're going to get into that in a bit but doing mm-hmm. what you do with it being such a heavy heavy subject I don't know how you don't bring like all of the God and all of the Jesus to all of the IT space. And I don't know how anyone really exists in the space that you're, that you're positioning yourself in without having a firm faith. So how do you even navigate that? Um, you know, it's hard, you know, initially just, you know, being in my Southern Baptist bubble, the internet brought on a world of exposure to other ideals and lifestyles and points of view and politics that I had always been made to believe were just bad and wrong. And so it was actually really enlightening to hear other points of view and, and to have um, powerful discourse with people that was productive and respectful. There's plenty of, you know, not respectful and not productive uh, dialogue online, but, you know, so it's cool being in this world because, um, I'm able to dialogue with a lot of intelligent people that don't always believe what I believe or believe anything at all. And it helps to help me refine why I believe what I believe. I've got to dig in and, and research and get to the core of why, why do I believe? And there are some things that I've got to come to terms with the fact that I will never be certain of. Um, but that's where faith comes in. So that's one element of it. Um, another thing is just, you see some of the hardest stuff you can possibly imagine. You know, there are a lot of people that know bad things happen to good people, but if they don't watch the news, they don't necessarily have to be faced with it. In our line of work specifically, bad things are happening to children uh, every single day. And um, you can easily get bogged down in that and brought down by it, or you can let it fuel your desire to work harder and work smarter and, and pursue the mission and um, educate as many families as you can and empower them so that hopefully it won't happen to another child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and how do you, and I'm, I'm, I want to hear like the backstory of, Mm -hmm. of the creation of the company and, and your fuel for that. But a question I've had from several people, I, I put it out there with my network you know, what's your, your really number one question you would like to ask to Tanya? Like, what would you like to know? And it it was interesting because it wasn't actually about the online monitoring or, Uh or anything. Their number one question was, how do you day in and day out see the most depraved form of humanity? And, and how do you sleep at night? How do you allow yourself to not like walk around in complete fear and angst and anxiety. And, and, and one said, and how do you not like murder these individuals? Like how do you not seek vengeance on your own? Oh gosh, it's hard. It's really hard. Um, so a few things, one is full disclosure. Um, I take 20 milligrams of Prozac every day because Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. apparently my body, uh, doesn't have a good balance of serotonin or dopamine Mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Like if I, if I don't do that, um, I am more prone to panic attacks, uh, brought on by encountering this really difficult stuff. So I, I take medicine, um, to help me, um, get over that. Um, also another thing I'm navigating is, you know, I, uh, was, um, sexually abused as a child, as a six-year-old. And so, um, this, this experience and this trauma is personal to me. It's very real to me and it can be re-traumatizing. Um, so I've got to be very careful of what I see and what I encounter and, and what I hear about, but it's also part of the therapy too, because, um, you can either put that hard stuff away in a box and bury it and think you're never going to have to deal with it. But whether you like it or not, it will surface and it will manifest, uh, through other problem areas in your life. And so I choose to, uh, deal with it, um, talk about it freely and publicly, uh, to help reduce the stigma for other people who are, are survivors. Um, and it's more than you'd think. I mean, it's one in four girls and one in six boys under the age of 18. So it's not like this random thing that happens happens to a lot of people. 
uh, and it's, it's, it's terrible. We need to a shed light on it and b fight it. We have got to fight it. And so that's, that's really what it is that keeps us all going is if we don't do the work that we're doing more children will be hurt. And so, um, it's yucky. It's terrible. It's awful, but we are optimistic and, and have hope that we will make an impact. We will protect children. Um, we will prevent this from happening for more children. And, you know, it's, it's the same for, you know, an EMT or a police officer or uh, fire rescue professionals that pull up on the scene of horrific accidents. Um, how do they deal with it? You know, there's, it's a lot of, you've got to be mindful of self-care. You've got to get enough sleep. Um, sometimes I go easy on the coffee because that has a propensity to make me anxious. Um, I personally really tried to avoid alcohol uh, because um, whenever I drink the next day, I'm just not worth anything. And every minute is a gift and I want to make the most of it. And it also just makes me more prone to anxiety and depression uh, if, if, I, if I drink alcohol. Um, and I know some people use it to relax and I, you know, everybody has to weigh that for how it affects them personally. Um, I make time for exercise. I have to exercise. Even if I don't want to, um, I will at least get outside for like a 20 minute walk or try to do a yoga class. I have to do something to be physically active because if my body is strong, my mind will be strong. My heart will be strong. I'll sleep better at night. And it's just, it's just so important. Um, taking time to decompress too. If I'm always online, if I'm always answering emails and always on Instagram, looking at everybody's best lives, that's not going to be very good for me. So just turning everything off and just cuddling my dog and hugging my family and doing art, painting, getting out in nature, just anything to connect with the real world um, is also key. And I find it interesting that the people in this space are some of the very first ones to say, disconnect from tech yes. and go explore nature and go enjoy nature and get outside. It's a great tool. It is a great resource, but we cannot let it be our lives yes. and how, and, and certainly not how we connect with, with creation um, and people. And so what type of boundaries do you have? Do you have like set parameters of times that you are on your phone, not on your phone? Um, it's less about that just because the nature of my work, I, right. I can't do that, I, yeah. but it's a great strategy for me. It's, um, I prioritize sleep because if you don't get enough sleep, your mental health is off and your whole day is shot. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, earlier in my career, I would, after my son would go to bed, I would get back on the computer and work, 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 work. Now I make sure that I'm asleep no later than 10 PM, sometimes 9 PM. Mm -hmm. Um, so prioritizing sleep helps me be, you know, as strong as I can mentally and physically the next day. Um, also I just, I just pay attention to what I'm doing on a screen. Mm -hmm. Am I doing something productive or am I passively avoiding feelings? Am I avoiding something I need to do instead, whether it's laundry or dishes or a tough conversation? Like I just try to be very intentional with why am I on this thing right now? And it's mm -hmm. okay to be entertained. It's okay if you want to watch a Netflix show or be on Instagram for a little bit and, and just be entertained. But again, it all goes back to we're only on this planet for a very short amount of time. Whether I have one more day left here or 40 more years left here, it's still not a lot of time. And so what are you going to do with that time? Um, I personally don't feel like I need to be zoning out with tech for a majority of that time. And that's something really important to convey to our kids. They're going to learn more by watching you uh, than by listening or tuning you out. And so that's a conversation I have with my child multiple times because he loves gaming and we let him play video games. We let him watch TV and, and that sort of thing. But I'm always very, very intentional around talking with him about the fact that screens light up a part of your brain that is the pleasure center. It's the same part of your brain that, that gets excited when you eat ice cream or nerds or whatever. And um, when you feed that part of your brain, it wants more and more and more. It's, it's, it's the addiction part. And so you have to be very in control 
So, you know, I say to him, are you in control of Fortnite or is Fortnite in control of you? And that is the same thing that mommy has to do with Instagram. Is mommy in control of Instagram or is Instagram in control of her? Um, you know, feeling like you're a hamster in a wheel of just, I have to respond to every single notification is not a good place to be. And so if you feel like you can't keep up with the digital communications that are heading your way, it's time to strip it back, unsubscribe, um, have some time off for yourself. Again, get outside. Like who is in control, you or the tech? Oh, and I think it's such a, such a relevant like point to hit home right now with everyone. I have multiple businesses that are ran online. And so I understand, I get it when, when, and I know, I know when my mind is spinning and I'm not able to focus and I'm not clear, I know it's time for yoga and it's time for meditation and it's time for physical activity. Like, and it's time to just walk away. I get it. I totally understand. Yeah. So I want to, I want to really like talk about Bark, Mm -hmm. what it is. Our CEO, Brian Basin is a dad of two and he was working at Twitter at the time. He's, he's so smart and has an extensive background in social media and technology. And so it came time for his oldest to get an iPod touch. And when he was looking at it and realized, wow, he can access all this stuff and it, that can access him. And he looked at the landscape of parental controls and was like, there's, there's nothing out there that's like good. That's mm-hmm. going to help keep him safe online and not be another job for me to do. Mm-hmm. So he left Twitter to start Bark. Oh, wow. See, I didn't know that. Well, again, I um, get, wish I could take the glory. <laughs> And the credit for this amazing idea, but I can't. Thankfully, uh, Brian reached out to me to to join the team. And I've been a part of the team for a very long time. And um, and I'm so thankful for that. And and so now let's talk about what Bark is and what Bark does. And I'll start with an example. You know, my son is 11. He has a smartphone, which some kids aren't ready for a smartphone at 11. And that's okay. So this isn't a conversation about when is the best time to give your kid a smartphone, but he does have one. Um, And uh, the phone number that is associated with his phone used to belong to somebody else. And so apparently that was a man who uh, was receiving notifications for medicine that would help uh, him enlarge his member. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, And so that was a fun conversation to have with my child. Thankfully, I had Bark monitoring my son's phone. And so I got an alert for sexual content via text and email. It said, hey, your son has encountered sexual content. Here's what happened. And it was a screenshot of the text that that came into him. And so he came to me about it, actually, which was incredible. But if he hadn't, I would know, man, my 11-year-old now uh, potentially has questions about erections and erectile dysfunction. And, Uh you know, it it might be time for me or his dad to talk to him about that. Uh Thankfully though, he, he took a screenshot of it and texted (laughs) it to me and and was like, uh, mom, I got this sketchy text. (laughs) How do I block this person? And I was like, yes, like, thank you for telling me. Cause so many times kids aren't going to want to surface these things to their parents. Cause a lot of times a parent's first gut instinct is take it away. Uh Like you shouldn't have that then. And that's, that's a fine reaction, but it's also not always productive and mm-hmm. could potentially make your child not want to bring other things to your attention in the future because mm-hmm. they don't want to lose their access to, to tech and gaming and their friends. And so, so anyway, that's an example of, of just how Bark works and what it does. But high level, Bark is tech that keeps kids safer online. How does it do that? You go to bark.us. That's our website. Um, you sign up. It's a free seven day trial. And then it's $9 per family per month after that. And unless you have connect. my, unless you have the podcast yes. discount and then it's oh, seven. Yes. See, <laughs> see, we are winning. We are winning uh-huh. together. Yep. Um, and so then you'll connect Bark uh, to your children's devices and accounts. We cover over 30 social media platforms, text messages and emails, iOS devices, Android devices, um, we even have a Chrome extension, you know, but don't get bogged down in all those details because every family has a different tech setup. Um, so you'll connect the kids' devices and accounts, and then it's an algorithm that just runs in the background. And when it encounters something problematic, like 
sexual content, cyberbullying, thoughts of suicide and depression, potential drug use, online predators, and acts of violence. It'll then send you an alert via text and email with not only what happened and where it happened and between whom it happened, but it'll also give you best recommended next steps for how to address, whether it's, well, here's how you block this contact, or here's what you need to do to report to law enforcement, or here are some mental health resources for your child. So that's, that's what Bark does. Hey friends, if you're a parent like me, I don't have to tell you how scary of a time it is to be raising teenagers. While the internet is an amazing resource that brings us together each and every week, it can also be a playground for hidden dangers. That's why we at The Power Project have partnered with Bark, an app that's dedicated to help keep kids safe online and in real life. Last year alone, Bark helped protect nearly 3 million kids with their groundbreaking products for families and schools. By monitoring text messages, YouTube, emails, and 24 different social networks for potential safety concerns like cyberbullying, self-harm, violence, sexual predators, and more, Bark allows busy parents to rest easier knowing their kids are better protected from digital dangers. You can head over to bark.us and use promo code POWERPROJECT to save 15% off your order. That's bark.us, promo code POWERPROJECT. I have to tell you a couple of funny things about that um, as a bark user. So Mm -hmm. my, my kids all, they do airsoft wars. Right. And so Uh I get notifications all the time about like the airsoft guns, violence, right. Gun violence. And then um, they shoot basketball after school. So I get notifications, you know, when they, do you want to shoot today? Are we going to shoot after school? And so we have a lot of dialogue amongst my, my son and his friends. They all know I, see everything that they talk about. And so they think it's funny to try to make my bark notifications blow up during the day. (laughs) (laughs) They're like intentional about it. Like, and they think it's so cute, but I'm like, but because of that, like they know that, that it's a safe place for starters, but that Mm -hmm. also that, that, okay, there are people paying attention and we need to be held accountable. You know, he's in eighth grade. So it's, it's that world. So I get a lot of notifications in the eighth grade. And then, um, and then some of the Chrome, some of the Chrome, uh, notifications will go off when he does his history papers that are talking about war, but it's so useful and it's so helpful. And we have discussions when there are, when there are things that, that notifications that I receive that are, uh, depressive or, or a little, uh, cyber bullying, or, you know, we have the conversation about that and he has his freedom where I don't have to go through his phone every night because it's being done for me. Um, it, it really takes a big burden off my shoulders and it also like covers things that fall through the cracks because I've had parental controls on all of my kids' devices, but I, for Christmas, my youngest got a Chromebook a new Chromebook and I didn't have him set up on bark yet. And I didn't have his, didn't realize I didn't have his YouTube settings turned correctly. Yep. So while he was looking at what's inside videos, like, you know, where they cut things apart and look inside uh, some really disturbing things came up that I have shared with my network since then that I can't even believe are on YouTube because it's straight grooming videos. Like it's, Mm. it's like normalizing really, really awful conversations mm. to children in an mm. animated cartoon style. So thank you for being a part of this and doing what you do because I, as a parent, am a huge advocate. So that's my bark commercial. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> literally it's um, yeah. And you know, you can toggle your severity alerts. If you, if you're getting too many uh, benign violent alerts. You can uh-huh. maybe change that setting a little bit. And no, um, I want all, I don't want to talk about anything. I want <laughs> everything. I know me too. Me too. <laughs> but some parents don't. And so, you know, we, we try to cater to all different parenting styles and choices. Um, and on that note too, if you're the type of person that thinks, okay, I don't need to monitor I'll just, I'll know when something's wrong with my child or I'll be able to spot check my child's phone. I want you to really think again, because children are going to delete the most concerning pieces of content from their phone before they get home from school or their friend's house. They'll delete the text thread. They'll hide photos in a vault app that looks just like a calculator app. 
Um, they'll use secret messaging apps that maybe look like something like a coloring book. You know, it's just kids are smart. And I hate to say it, but they're they're way more tech savvy than we are because oh, they're digital way. natives. Yeah. yeah. So just just keep that in mind that you could you could literally make it your full time job to monitor your kid online yourself and still miss stuff. So mm-hmm. it's not easy. It is not easy to be a parent in 2020. No, it's not. I like I literally I tell people that it's it's really like the scariest time to parent kids and teenagers and because every single thing is at their fingertips. Like all the good in the world and all the bad in the world is at their fingertips. So true. So you, um, and, and for anyone here that is, um, there, there's so much that can be said about monitoring online safety and, and parental controls and bark and all the resources. You guys have a great blog where you give, step-by-step tutorials and videos. And it's not just installing the Bark app. It's Mm -hmm. also part of what you're saying that the digital natives thing stuck out to me because I'm the generation, I'm assuming you're close to my generation. We're the generation that grew up without it. And it was introduced in our like early adulthood. So we're, I can't, there's like a little title that I can't ever remember. It's like not a Gen X, but a Gen something. Um, We're like a, a, a very short decade period. Yeah. And then, you know, our parents are the ones who, who didn't have it all their lives until later. And then our children have been birthed into it, Mm -hmm. but it's our responsibility to educate ourselves and learn. And it's, it's, it's only getting to, it's only going to become a bigger thing. And so we have to learn how, just like you had to learn how to breastfeed, right? Like you had to learn latch, just like you had to learn how to teach them safety on a bicycle, Mm -hmm. just all the stages of life, this is our responsibility as a parent. And we're doing a great disservice to an entire generation if we're not being aware, if we're thinking it's too large of a problem and it's too big of a deal. So I want, so so I, so I really want to lean into um, the online predator part because I do, I'm I'm an advocate in the fight against human trafficking. I, and I try to convince people on a regular basis that it doesn't look like the movie Taken. It um, It's not some scary dude hiding out in the aisle of Walmart that is following you on a trafficking stink. Like it's, it's someone online building a solid relationship with your child. Like, yeah, yeah that's um, one of the biggest takeaways. And I've, I've spoken with law enforcement officials that have been working in this field of human trafficking for over 30 years. And it's the fact that there is no profile for an online predator. It could be the sketchy guy in Walmart. It can also be the acclaimed pediatrician that has been treating children for 30 years. Um, they are they are businessmen with families and pets, and they are dudes that live in their mother's basement. It runs the gamut. And so because of that, because there is no profile, uh, that means that some of the people who are are harming our children, even without ever meeting them in real life, um, are people who are typically trusted members of society. And so that's that's one thing that will help reduce the stigma and raise awareness is that, unfortunately, teaching kids that anybody can be a tricky person, you've got to trust your gut. If it feels off, it's off. And it doesn't matter who that is, whether it's a principal or a doctor or a preacher or a teacher. If it feels off, it's off and you listen to that. Um, And so with our predator project, you know, if you haven't read the piece, I encourage it, but you know, trigger warning, if you, you know, can, can accept the the hard things that are in it. Um, We, a member of our special projects team at Bark went undercover, a mom, a 37 year old mom went undercover as an 11 year old on Instagram and posted very, very innocent content, very typical Hey, I'm 11. Here's a coffee cup. Here's my dog. Here's a flower. Here's a fun Snapchat filter, puppy dog filter, whatever, like really normal stuff. And within moments had messages from adult men looking to contact her uh, for nefarious purposes. Um, a lot of, a lot of questions we receive are, well, would this have happened if it was not a public account? And we actually tested it with public and private accounts you can still get messages even if your account is private. So that's key for parents to know. Um, Your children's accounts should be private. That will help mitigate some of that risk, but it it won't eliminate it. Um, 
also Instagram recently launched the ability in their app to toggle off direct messages um, if you're a child. But again, there's nothing stopping your child from going on Instagram after and untoggling it. So again, it's, it's just, it's a, it's just a, it's a game of cat and mouse. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, we went undercover and, and, and these men, uh, what was really surprising was just the speed at which the conversations escalated from, Hey, you're cute. Are you home alone? Do you have a boyfriend? How old are you? Even though it clearly said on her profile, Mm -hmm. who, um, would you like to trade pictures? Uh, can I, can I pay you for pictures of your feet? Um, show me a picture of yourself with your top off, you know, please baby. And it, and then escalating to some really, really harsh, uh, you know, controlling behavior, you know, where are you now? Send me a picture of you touching your nose. Um, I don't believe you're going to the grocery store. Text me a picture of the cereal you're looking at, like really, really controlling behavior. Um, sextortion, you know, threatening to use photos and conversations against the the profile if she didn't comply with certain demands, um, video chatting. You know, if your child's on Instagram, a, a video call can just start from anywhere around the world, um, even if they're not friends with that person. And so the men that would call this this persona just to see a glimpse of a child, uh, it was just disgusting. And I've heard, and I, even being, I'm a member of a coalition where we have Homeland Security and FBI and, and 42 organizations that are all diligently fighting this and, and acutely aware of this, even being involved there, I was, uh, highly taken aback by Mm -hmm. this article. And, and I'm not certain if it's an article that you all had put out or something I read somewhere else. But what I didn't realize, they talked about online predators and the amount of time they will spend at a computer where, where when they do a staying in a bust, sometimes that predator has been there for days, not leaving a computer because they are searching for children online. They're not accidentally finding your child online. They're there for a reason. Absolutely. It's, uh, that's another thing with this project. You know, we gave these adult men every out possible. We were, we were not sitting there like a mouse trap trying to do everything we could to catch them. We mm-hmm. kept giving them outs like, Hey, just want you to know, like I'm 15. Is that okay? And, you know, constantly reminding them like we, you know, this is a child, this is a child, this is a child. And yet they just wanted more. Um, and, you know, you know, your hope is that maybe they're just, made a mistake and maybe they're having a weak moment and this isn't something that they do frequently, but as you dig in, you, you realize that it's, it's, it's awful and it's prevalent. Um, one organization that we've been, you know, really honored to work with is the child rescue coalition. Um, and they're working to raise awareness to the level of being able to identify computers around the world that have this material on them, child sex abuse material. Um, And so knowing that and being able to deploy law enforcement to the doors of the homes of these people is really, really empowering. Um, Huge, huge. Yeah. 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 So um, there's a lot we uncovered, but there's also a lot of hope. Um, Another thing that's, that was really scary is just, again, the speed with which a child can be abused online. So you might let your 12 year old stay home alone. They have an iPhone. They're playing around on Instagram. By the time that you put your car in reverse to back down the driveway, just to go to the grocery store and back, they could have encountered uh, male genitalia, videos of masturbation, requests for things and acts that they might not even know about. I mean, this happened over and over and over again and very quickly. And um, it's just a a stark contrast to our day when somebody with those intentions would have to get to know us, be a coach, be a teacher, have multiple interactions with us before that sort of thing could take place. So it's, it's really devastating. Are your kids on social media or is your son on social media? No. Um, And I, I say that he has Spotify 
because he loves music. And I just recently realized, and you can have followers on Spotify. And so that's kind of an important thing to him right now is like, oh, well, my friend so-and-so has 34 followers and I only have 32. And I don't like that. I don't like that. It's not enough for me to say you can't have Spotify, but it's enough for me to be like, you know what? The amount of followers does not dictate Mm -hmm. your worth as a human. Mm -hmm. And um, we have to have conversations around just how that can affect your self-esteem. And so all sorts of tech now has a social element to it. Mm-hmm. Um, everything seems to be gamified these days. So mm-hmm. no, I, I do not want my son to have Instagram or Snapchat or any social media platforms for a while. Mm-hmm. I don't see much positive to it. And I see mm-hmm. a lot of negative. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, as he gets older, that's going to be the way that he and his friends communicate mm-hmm. outside of text messaging. And, um, I will entertain letting him have it at some point. Um, I also just know the rate at which children are exposed to pornographic material and how that can affect their future sexual health. Mm -hmm. And I'm not in any hurry to help him get access to that kind of stuff sooner than, than it's coming. Do you have any type of uh, like numbers on, on what a kid's exposure to porn is increased if they are on social media versus not? And it's okay if you don't, because I put no, you on the spot. No, I don't. And that would be an interesting study for us to run. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we monitor close to 5 million children across the nation now. And so that's something I'm, I'm, I'll probably ping our data scientist about, because we know how many children encounter pornography each year, mm-hmm. but as to where it's happening, that's a, that's something important to take a look at. And what's the, do you, do you have any idea about the age range that kids are exposed to porn at this point? Cause I know it's way younger than when we it were It is kids. way younger. It is way younger. I mean, our study, um, covered tweens and teens. So a tween is, you know, an, an eight to 12 year old, mm-hmm. but it's happening younger than eight. If you mm-hmm. give your child an iPad with unfettered access, let's say you just want to catch a quick shower and they're on Netflix without a parental control pen, boom, mm-hmm. they have stumbled mm-hmm. upon something. If they're on YouTube, it could be something that looks like innocent cartoon cartoons, but it's mm-hmm. it's anime porn. I mean, mm-hmm. it's the thing is, is the younger they are, the less they're able to even understand that this isn't good for them or this mm-hmm. is concerning or maybe they just think somebody's being hurt. You know, they don't understand it. And so mm-hmm. um, if your children have unfettered access to content that allows pornographic material on its platform. It's only a matter of time. It's not a matter of, of if, but when. Mm -hmm. So my kids are not on social media. My, and my son gets teased and made fun of that. He doesn't have Snapchat and he's in the eighth grade. And I'm like, listen, high schools next year, you're going to get made fun of for so many other things than just (laughs) Snapchat. (laughs) Just, you know, just, it's, it's fine. Um, so, so we don't do social media and, and I am in a place where, and I don't have the answers for this and I don't expect you to have the answers for this, but kind of what you spoke to, this is the way we interact. This is the world we're in this. I, I really love social media. There's a whole lot of it that I hate, but I like, I use social media as a faith tool and I, there are people in the world hearing about Jesus and God and faith and overcoming obstacles because of social media. So I know that my children are going to be there. I know they're going to be in this space that's going to look drastically different down the road. So I am uh, cognizant about how I prepare them for that without them ever being exposed to that. And I, I look at it like the way I consider it is my background, both sides of my family were Pentecostal and, and my parents were much more open with me in the world, but I have cousins that were incredibly like sheltered and, and not allowed to access anything. So then when they got freedom, they went like insane with all of it. Right. So, um, and if you're listening cousins, I love you. So does Jesus. You're good. (laughs) 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 Um, So, but so just saying like, this is something that can be used for good, but this is something that can be used for bad, but you're not old enough to access it yet. I don't know how to set them up. Do you have any suggestions or recommendations or advice? Yeah. I mean, you have to really take it case by case. Um, Your 
you know your child, you know their struggles. Do they have a propensity to uh, struggle with FOMO, maybe body image issues? Um, I know personally, Instagram would have been horrible for me as a teenage girl. Um, and so, sorry, I'm walking with you while I let my chihuahua out yeah. because she's totally be in this fine. Closed room anymore. Um, but yeah, you, you have to evaluate when it's best for your child and you have to talk openly and honestly about it. You know, right now, um, I tell, he's not even asking cause he knows better, but if he were, let's say he wanted Snapchat at 11, I would say no. And here's why there's this thing called snap maps in there. And if you have it toggled on anybody that you're connected with, will see your location so clearly down to the level where they could zoom in and see what the front of the building of your in that you're in looks like mm-hmm. as your mom. I can't, I, I would, I wouldn't drop you off at the mall and just leave you there for three hours. I'm not going to let you walk 10 miles to school by yourself. I'm not going to let you have Snapchat. And mm-hmm. that's just one of the reasons why also there are, uh, bots out there looking to expose you to pornography and mm-hmm. get images of yourself and they will even offer you money. And while I know you're smarter than that, there are kids that have had lapses in judgment and have fallen into that trap again. No, I'm not ready for you to be just even navigating that world. So mm-hmm. part of the way to talk to your kids about the why behind why you won't let them opens the door for you to have those conversations about things that are not comfortable mm-hmm. and, and will allow you when it is time to say, okay, I- I'm going to let you have this now, but you have to be cognizant of these things. And I need you to come to me when you encounter them. Mm -hmm. You know, I I wasn't ready for my son to um, play Fortnite when it first came out. Uh, Again, I was mostly concerned about the addictive elements of it, but I was Mm -hmm. also worried a little bit about the violence and and the group chat that eventually I led him. And um, he knew to come to me when somebody messaged him. Somebody messaged him and said, hey, I'm horny. Let's chat here. And Mm -hmm. thankfully, because of the multiple conversations we had, he was able to, to show it to me without worrying that I would take it away from him. Mm -hmm. Um, Another important thing to do is to, when you see things in the news, talk about it with your kids. Um, So much of, you know, even adults, but children's self-confidence is based on how many followers they have, how much engagement they have, and letting them know that accepting every friend request on whatever platform, even if it seems like a fellow 12-year-old or a friend of a friend, is not wise. It can be very bad for you. And children, very smart children have been lured out of their homes and kidnapped and murdered by people who they thought were their friends. Um, And so it's not something fun that we want to talk about with our kids. But if you don't, they're not going to understand why you don't want them to have this. They're just going to think you just want to say no for the heck of it. Mm -hmm. So having those tough conversations about the why behind your reasoning Um, it's the same thing, you know, why do I have to wear a bike helmet? Well, here's why, you know, 50% of kids that don't wear one die in the ER, just, you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. you have to, you have to tell them the tough things and then they understand it's not because you're trying to control them. It's because you care them, care for them. It is your job to keep them safe on this planet in real life and now in their digital life. And this is how you do it. So my youngest is he'll be 11. He'll be 11 next week. And he like, it's the funniest thing. Cause he'll say, mom, can we download? The-? And I have another tip parents. I have like parental settings on my kids' phones where they can't install or delete apps without my passcode, because that keeps you from, uh, from them installing them while they're at school, downloading them while they're at school and then deleting them before they get home. I learned this lesson from firsthand from a friend going through it with her, her sons who were a little bit older than I was or than my kids were, but the running line he'll say is like, mom, will you download this, this for me? And I'll say no. And he'll say, oh, because that's where online predators hang out. Like that's his like, cause that's like the running line. And can I have this? No online predators hang out there. No, it's, yeah. it's just not even up for discussion. Like you said, yeah. they need to know why they need to not know that we're just like mean controlling parents, boomers. Okay. Boomer. If you don't know what that is, that means we're old, even though we're not (laughs) in the boomer generation, kids are nuts. Uh, so, so yeah. So I think that that's, that's great. Like what you just said, like, give them the reason, let them know why you're trying to keep them safe. I know it gets harder the older they get and the more 
because we, we get into that. I'm reaching for my own independence, but I don't have the maturity to deal with the responsibility that comes with that. I, I'm so grateful. I didn't have to grow up with Instagram in high school because girls were terrible and I can't even imagine having it on there, but I think it comes with educating and, Mm -hmm. and, and really talking very closely about that on the online, uh, gaming Mm -hmm. chat rooms. Mm -hmm. So I know that what I've been told in, in the coalition, in the space that I run in is that that's the scariest, most dangerous area right now, because we don't have the visibility in those online chat rooms that, that is there on the social media platforms. Mm -hmm. Is this something that Bark is working on? Yeah, we're actively working, uh, to get access. Uh, you know, if anybody listening right now has a position of power at, at the large gaming networks, um, please email help at bark.us and let's figure out a way to let our algorithm scan for predatory behavior and then alert parents so that their kids are safer. Um, you as a because parents, par- I'm sorry, because parents don't realize no. that is a space that, that predators are actively hanging out in and absolutely, and absolutely. And I'm thankful Microsoft recently launched an initiative, um, to try to do better with that. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. And, and games like Roblox, um, do a really good job of, of shutting down that sort of behavior when it's happening. Um, but it's, you know, where the kids are, that's where the predators are going to go. And, um, if there are tools that can be used to prevent that, they should absolutely be used. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is your, because it's, it's heavy. It's dark. Mm -hmm. It's scary. There are people that will listen to this and freak out and say, I don't even need a monitoring app. I'll take all the tech away. Um, but your kids are going to be exposed to it, whether they have it on their phone or they look at it on someone else's phone. Mm -hmm. So what is your greatest victory in, in this journey? And what is the most beauty that you've been able to bring from everything you've done up until this point on the journey? Hmm. That's a, that's a tough question. Um, I think one of my greatest victories to date is just having confidence that at least for now, my son will come to me when he encounters troublesome content because I've laid the groundwork for the fact that we can have open and honest conversations about icky, uncomfortable, awkward things. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that started at a very young age just by like, when I was talking about him with him about his body parts, I would use their real names. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, it is what it is. This is what it's called. And this is how it works in the end. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that has been beautiful to me that I haven't had to just not let him have access to everything. I've been able to give him some access and trust him and help him to be a responsible digital native. Um, another thing, one of the biggest challenges I had was just how do I talk to my kid about sex and pornography when it just makes him squeamish. He does not want to talk about that stuff, especially not with mom. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's a book called Good Pictures, Bad Pictures Mm -hmm. that I highly recommend for all parents and get it on Amazon. And they have a version for younger kids and a version for older kids. And it just helps to explain, you know, what it is when it, I mean, it's a topic. I mean, it's just so hard, Mm -hmm. so hard. So being able to just, give him materials and have these discussions uh, thanks to wonderful authors is key. Um, The parenting in a tech world Facebook group. We've got over 60,000 parents now in this closed Facebook group called parenting in a tech world, where we're talking about these exact issues, whether your child is being cyber bullied or is a cyber bully, or your child is caught up in a sexting scandal or feeling pressured to send nudes. Um, When do you give your child their smartphone? When do you let them have social media? You know, we have all the all kinds of parents and experts in that group talking about this stuff in real time. Um, so that that's a win. To, to, that's to a major create, win. Yeah, major to have, win. Have created a community where we can just go and talk because who, where do you go? Who do you talk to about this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think also it's um, it goes back to that whole like not my child, not my son, and 
and my kids, I was kind of introduced to having to have the porn conversation earlier than I was prepared for because Mm -hmm. before I would tell my kids that I'm, I'm fighting for slaves. I'm bringing awareness for slaves. And who are the slaves? Well, they're, they're kids that that are forced to do things against their will and they're, you know, not kept in good circumstances. And, and that was really all they needed at that level. They, they didn't need any more details. And my youngest Mm -hmm. is still at that level, but my oldest had some kids mentioning porn at school Mm -hmm. and he wasn't completely aware of what it was, but he, he knew the general idea of it. And we had a conversation where I point blank said, do you know what porn is? Um, because I knew the way he was responding to things. And he, he says, he tells me yes. And that some of the older kids were discussing it. And so that opened a conversation where I was able to say, first off, those people don't want to be there or want to be doing what they're doing. Even if you think they are, you know, that's mm-hmm. against their will. And that is the major gateway for trafficking. And, and, and then we went on to say, this isn't what it looks like. And this isn't what God created it for. And when you see that, and when you consume that content, it changes your mind to think of it in a way that God didn't create it for. And so, but being able to come to a community like this, to have this mm-hmm. resource, because there's a lot of women walking around that have mom guilt that, oh my God, my kid found it and I let it happen. Or, oh my God, my kid's a bad kid that searched for it. Or, yeah. but that safe space that you've created with, with this, you know, not technically created, but that you guys as a collaborative have created with this is what we need. Like more than anything in our society right now, we need the ability to show up and sit around a table, whether it's figurative or literal. Yes. And problem solve. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that's really important to remind parents, myself included, is that a child's frontal lobe is not fully formed until the early twenties. And so good kids make bad choices. Mm -hmm. Good kids make mistakes. And Mm -hmm. so letting that filter down to your kids that like, Hey, that's why you have a parent Mm -hmm. is because you are not actually physically (laughs) able to make good choices all the time. I trust that you'll do the best you can, but your brain's just not ready yet. That's why I'm here to to help you until you get there. Um, So, you know, everybody is doing the best they can as a parent and you, you can't beat yourself up about it, but you just have to, you have to do what you can. You know, there's a lot of free parental controls just built into things you already have, whether it's your cable service provider, internet service provider. Again, I mentioned Netflix has parental controls. Um, you know, there's a lot of your router. I mean, there's a lot of things that if you just do a little bit of Googling, um, you can implement to just help help that parenting burden that, that we have with limiting our child's access. Um, and again, the screen time thing is key. You know, the less time they have on a screen, the less chances they have to encounter bad stuff. But, you know, then there's the bus. Then there's right. friend houses. There's, you know, it used to be when kids went for play dates or sleepovers, it was like, you know, do you have a gun? Is it unloaded, et cetera. Now it's, do your kids have unfettered access to the internet? <laughs> so, Girl, I've had this exact conversation, like your heart to my heart. It's like- <laughs> You're concerned whether they have guns in their house. You also need to be concerned about whether they have a password on their Wi-Fi or parental settings or what are they doing on, in the chat room. So yeah, I um, I really, really appreciate you sharing with our audience and and educating us and sharing your story and, and being just coming from a vulnerable, authentic place to say, we don't have all the answers, but we're working towards them and we're striving together. Yes. What would you what would you want to say to maybe the mom that is, has a, a, a 17, 18 year old in high school and she's not prepared for this and she hasn't set up for this up until now. And all of a sudden she's faced with it, whether she likes or not, likes it or not. Yeah. What would you, what would you just kind of leave her with? That's probably the hardest use case, honestly, because by the time a kid is 18 and an adult, by the time they're 17, they're almost an adult and it's, it's really hard. And so, um, letting your child know that they can come to you free of judgment for the hardest things possible, and you are going to love them through it and support them through it is key. 
it's kind of like those parents that set up a, like a, a text code, you know, if their kids are at a party and there's drinking and they want to leave, but they're embarrassed, you know, I could never do that with my parents. I, I would be too afraid that I get in trouble. So I would just sit there and bear it. But letting, letting your kids know like, Hey, I realize that your world is not going to be perfect. You are not going to make perfect choices. I am here to protect you. I'm here to love you. You know, that's, that's where you are in the world of a 17 year old. Not only that, but just knowing their landscape, you know, the rate of suicide is the second suicide is the second leading cause of death now in kids 10 to 17. So if you haven't talked to your child about mental health and suicide, um, it is time when they're 17, if not much, much sooner. Um, Talking about pornography and how it changes your brain and impacts your relationships down the road is also really important. Um, talking just about mental health and, and the state of things, you know, it's just, if they're 17 and they're struggling and you're struggling and you have not had those tough conversations yet, start with that. But then honestly, it might be time to reach out to a professional, uh, your child's pediatrician, mental health, uh, support specialists. There are resources at schools. Um, bottom line is get the help you need. If you and your gut feel like something's not right. It's never too late to take the first step to try to make it right. So don't, don't give up is Mm -hmm. what I'd say. Thank you. I think that's great. I think that's, um, solid information. It's about having the conversations with your children and yes, and not just creating a community that's a safe space for parents, but we have to create that safe space with our children and, Mm -hmm. and let them know that they can talk to us about the scary things. Um, God, that's my, that's my biggest wish and my biggest hope for my children that they just know they can talk to me and it breaks my heart if they don't ever feel that open door. So thank you for putting that out there. Thank you for sharing that with everyone. And we so appreciate your time. Uh, You've given the bark.us website. Where can people follow you? Because you do some great um, insightful, encouraging uh, social media work yourself. Oh, thank you. How do, how does everyone stay in the loop here? Yeah. So if you want to connect with me, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the places, um, it's just my name. Thankfully, my, my name is super unique. So I was able to grab all the handles uh, and that's Titania Jordan. So just Google Titania Jordan and connect with me, whether it's LinkedIn or Instagram or wherever, and i um, happy to, to talk with you. Um, same thing. My email address is just Titania Jordan at Gmail or Titania at bark.us. Um, I'm not always <laughs> quick to respond because my inbox is a hornet's nest. Right, right. But I'm happy to connect with anyone here. I'll put all of that in the show notes. What's your favorite, what's your personal favorite social media platform? Instagram. Oh, I have a love-hate relationship with Instagram. We're going to get there too. one day. No, I like, I, I have found a really hard time of finding like organic connection over there. Whereas I don't know. I'm an old school Facebook kind of girl, but uh, yeah, Yeah. we'll get there. We'll get there. there. Thanks so much. Have a great day. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. You take good care. You too. Oh man, you guys, my favorite part about this show is the amazing women that I get to meet every single week. I love hearing their stories and I love bringing their stories to you guys. I certainly hope that you're inspired to go out and lead your own purpose-filled lives after listening to these guests week in and week out. If you are inspired by something you've heard in this show, can I ask a favor? Can you go please write a review? Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. Give us a rating. We'll take five stars if you're feeling generous. And then tell all your friends about us so that we can continue to bring you these guests. And by the way, are you hanging out with us on Instagram? Because you should be. It's at the underscore power project. Check us out. As always, I hope that you enjoyed this show and I cannot wait to chat with you next week. But until then, you guys go out and lead your best purpose-filled lives.